A lot of things in our life are driving us forward. Technology, tomorrow, all the demands that are to come. It's so much that times don't you want to go back. Let's go back to a childhood. I'm not saying going back to the entirety of childhood. Just would you with me for a moment think of something, a time, an hour that was wonderful. Second grade from noon until 1.15. That's my time. Second grade, what do we get to do at noon? We have lunch. Second graders are not cynical yet about school lunch. They think it's an adventure not to have to eat mom's cooking. So this is good. I love second grade lunch. What do we get to do after lunch? Recess. Oh my gosh. In first grade, you're still making friends. You've got friends in second grade, so let's go play with those friends on the teeter-totters and the swings and that little orange thing that goes around and around and around until lunch doesn't feel that good anymore. But it's all good. And then we come in, and my second grade teacher, after we came in from recess, sat us down and said, every day, let me read you a story. Is life good? I had a wonderful hour and 15 minutes. Let's go back. There's got to be some of that in what Jesus said. Have faith like a child. Not childish, and not escaping all of the world, but have faith that in some way takes you back to some parts of being a child. There must be a connection. So let's see what that connection is. Let's go back. To go back, maybe I could have you picture that scene of this text. Sunday school pictures may be coming to mind. Maybe a stained glass window somewhere. Jesus is seated with the little children. There's one child on his knee. There's other children around, maybe a mom or two in the background. Isn't that a great picture? To that picture, in our childhood, I would add just one thing. There should be a favorite book or two. If you got a parent to sit down and be still for a moment, didn't you have a favorite book that you instantly whipped out and brought over to him and say, read this, here's mine. Johnny Tractor and His Pals, Corny Cornpicker Finds a Home. These are absolute my favorite books as a kid. See, I grew up on a dairy farm in western Minnesota, and these were giveaways from John Deere dealers to little kids back in the 1959, 1960, 61. Fantastic. Oh, by the way, these are really good stories. They're not long. I'm going to leave them right here. You come up afterwards. Go ahead. Just leave them. I mean, you know, but go ahead and read. Because didn't you love to get a story read? Did you know the story already? Oh, absolutely. You knew the story so well that if mom or dad tried to skip a page, you knew. But you wanted to hear it again. Picture that nearness, that time spent together. A willingness to take that time and that story from beginning to end one more time. Don't you want to go back? Well, here's the good news. That picture of Jesus is us. You are that child on his knee, and he's telling you a wonderful story. It's a story we already know. It's all the stories of him and his life that we already know. But has that ever stopped a child from saying, ah, I know this one? No. A child says, read it to me again. So what story do you need him to read to you again? Isn't that a wonderful thought? What story do you need? That'd make a wonderful prayer. Lord, what story should you remind me of? How about a prodigal son who ran away, came to his senses, came back, not to an angry father who condemned him, but a loving father who embraced him and celebrated that he was back. Tell me that story again. Tell me the story of a young man, David, facing a giant beyond all dimensions we can imagine, and God rescued him. Tell me that story, God. Tell me the story about a woman who, having lost a coin, would not stop until she found it. And remind me, Lord, I'm that coin, and you're the searching one. What story should you tell me, God? Isn't that a wonderful thought? You know, I've got to change that picture just a little bit, though, for you. In the picture of Jesus with the little one on his knee and the crowd of other children around, that's a moment, isn't it? It's just frozen. But if you would go forward, we know it changes. There are other children. You're on that knee right now, but your time's going to end. Everybody gets his turn. We learned that in second grade. Those mothers that are hovering around are going to not 
let you stay there forever. They're going to say, it's time for my child. And in the end, Jesus is going to have to get up and walk away because there's other things he has to do. But that's not our case. You are that child, and you get to stay as that child. Isn't that an amazing thought? You are the child that he is holding, the one to whom he's speaking, the one under whose hands you're being blessed, and it doesn't have to end. You're not getting shoved off by another impatient child, and he's not going to get up and say, well, I've got more important things to do than talk to you. You are that child. That moment, that picture, it's not a still life. It is your life. You are that child under the hands of the blessings of Jesus. Let's go back to that. Well, that's a picture of the story we would like to bring him, and that's a wonderful thing. Children bring great stories to moms, dads to be read, but we bring other things to them, and that depends on a certainty, a wonderful certainty that I trust you have. I hope you had as a kid growing up. I certainly did. And it's a single, simple sentence. My dad can fix anything. My dad could fix anything. My dad was a farmer, as I mentioned. My dad was in the Army as a mechanic in World War II. He was a farmer before that and came home and farmed the same land for 50 years. I'm not kidding. My dad could fix anything. It doesn't really matter to you, but I brought some of dad's stuff, some of dad's wrenches. There's an old, old vice grips, an old uh, combination. The owner's manual from a New Holland ba- uh, mower that we had. This has got my dad written all over it. My dad loved to fix things, to weld things. I'm the only son, so I'm his whole workforce. I, uh, I was reduced to this. Here, hold this. That was my role in life, and I was good at it. But my dad loved to fix things. I hope you had that experience, that no matter what it was, you dragged it over to dad, and he fixed it. Or maybe for you it was mom. Mom could untangle anything. Mom could find anything. Moms have that ability. I suspect moms could let us in on how they do it, but that's a secret that the moms of the world keep to themselves because then they have that secret and we don't. But moms can fix and find and dads can fix anything. Isn't that a wonderful thought to have to go to God? Let's be children again who have this wonderful central confidence. My dad can fix anything. What are you going to bring to him? Who can fix anything? Maybe it's the broken things. My dad was a wonderful welder. These are literally the vice grips we use over and over in the shop. Hold two pieces of metal together while dad welds them. What broken things need to be brought to your father who fixes everything? Well, maybe the things that we confessed privately and the things we said out loud. Broken. Broken promises. We said, I wasn't going to do that again, but I did. I was going to finally start doing the right thing, but I didn't. Those broken pieces we bring to our Father who fixes them. And He fixes them not by just giving us another week to try harder. He doesn't fix them by pointing out somebody so much better than we are. And why aren't you like that? He fixes them by taking all the broken pieces and fixing them on His Son. And fixing them on his son to his death. But by his resurrection, he is fixed, and we are too. Take the broken pieces to your father. Take the tangled things. You know, our daughters, we have two daughters, and they had an unusual talent to take, and this is a necklace that I don't think I've, yep, it's still good, that one of our daughters left behind. But this is in a very rare state. It's not tangled. This is not how it usually was. Normally, they would come up to either Holly or to me with this balled together mass of chain and say, can you untangle this? I always wanted to ask, honey, how in the world did you make it? Did it like this? But, you know, uh, it doesn't pay. Questioning the past won't untangle the present. Tugging on it, that's not going to work. That'll just make it worse. Don't, so blunt force trauma is not going to fix this. You have to slowly, slowly unravel and untangle Relationships look a lot like this, don't they? Relationships are tangled 
and complicated, and we can bring them to a Father who can fix everything. We might want to ask, why is it like this? Maybe we won't get an answer for that. Untangling doesn't demand explaining the past. Untangling is about the future. And bring to him the tangled mess that some relationships have become and say, yeah, you can fix anything. I know you can fix anything. Can you untangle this? What a wonderful confidence we have as children. My dad can fix anything. Well, we've talked about the past, those wonderful stories. We've talked about the problems of our present. You know there's got to be a future. The future is looking us right in the eye. I'm talking about the calendar. Just over two months, it's Christmas. Oh, about now, we're going to start hearing from the next two months all the Fleet Farm ads are telling us that all the toys have arrived at Fleet Farm, and we better get down there before they're all gone. All the ads are going to come in print. I've got an old toy catalog, American Girl doll catalog here from our daughter's days. Oh, all kinds of other ones are coming to your, your door. Oh, online, there's no end of them. So let's look ahead. Our son was about four years old. This would be about 1990. Christmas was coming. On a Sunday morning, he was going through a toy catalog, and he found what he wanted for Christmas, a train. Now, you've got to set the stage. This is Sunday morning. We're in Butternut, Wisconsin, where I was a parish pastor. I was doing the 8 o'clock service. Holly was getting the kids ready to come on over for the 9.30 service. So Steve brought up to Holly the toy catalog with the train. Doesn't that sound like a great Christmas gift? Here's the problem. And remember, this is a $1990. $400 for that train. So she admits that uh, it's a wonderful train, Steve. That would be really fun, but we're not going to get you a $400 train. Well, he was a little depressed, a little sad. And then he bounced back up. And he said, we're going to church this morning, aren't we? And she said, yes. And he said, maybe the sermon will tell me I'm getting the train. Isn't that wonderful? I gave the sermon that day. There was no train in the sermon, I can guarantee you. He's never gotten a train. And by the way, he's never gotten a $400 train for his two kids. I should bring that up to him. <laughs> but here's the point. He had a good idea, didn't he? He had a wonderful child's idea. Maybe if I go to church, the sermon will tell me the good things that I'm getting. I know when you listen to Pastor Howard, that's what you hear every Sunday. You've had that all your life, haven't you? The sermon has told you the good things you're getting. Forgiveness. It's yours. It's not conditional in case you maybe don't turn out all that well. It's taken away. No. It's not partial just for today, but don't, don't bet on tomorrow. Forgiveness. Let every sermon tell you it's yours. It's yours now and for the end of time. But there's more. I'm going to end this message by saying the wonderful ending we've heard so many times. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Peace. Children don't have to understand a gift to use the gift. We don't have to understand this peace to have it. It's His gift. Let it stand and let it guard your hearts and minds. But what shall I do, Lord? Here's another gift that every message should tell you. James 1.5, if anyone lacks wisdom, and that would be all of us putting our hands up, the rest of the verse says, let him ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and will be given to him. What a promise. That's the gift. One last one, and there's more, but one last one, John 14. And the carpenter said, in my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. And when I prepare the place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. That's your gift. Remember, it's yours. It's not conditional. It's not temporary. It is. And the sermons, all that you've heard and all that you will hear, should tell you that's what you're getting. And as children, we believe it. So let's go back. I wouldn't mind going back to second grade, at least for an hour or so. Lunch was great. Recess was fun. And we got a story. School should be that way. But let's really go back. Let's go back to be the center of that picture of children with Jesus. 
the center of a picture that doesn't end, and ask him, what story should I hear today? And he would but smile and say, this one. And he'll remind you. And you'll hear it together. Go back to a father who can fix anything. And bring him the broken and the tangled and say, but I know you can fix it. The faith of a child. And come back here and hear every message that promises you something more than a $400 train. Something like forgiveness and peace and wisdom and direction and a life with God that will never end. Let's go back. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.